Now we turn to hurricanes and the destruction they wreak. Dorian has caused dozens of deaths in parts of the Bahamas, but our next guest reminds us that the clouds remain long after the storm has passed. Back in August 2005, Hurricane Katrina wrecked the home of New Orleans writer Sarah Broom and tore up her city. Her debut memoir, The Yellow House, is an intimate look at a family that scattered across America but felt the gravitational pull of home. And she sat down with our Walter Isaacson to tell him about healing and what remains after all seems to have gone. Sarah, welcome to the show. And this is such a joy for me, uh, somebody from New Orleans, my hometown. And you grew up in what we call the East, which was a 1960s development. And for our viewers who mm -hmm. don't quite know the distinction, Talk about New Orleans East and what's called the Lower Ninth Ward. Sure. So New Orleans East is part of the Ninth Ward. And so the Lower Ninth is in the Ninth Ward. Both of those areas are essentially bifurcated from the city by a navigation channel called the Industrial Canal, which connects the Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain. And so New Orleans East, it's a huge area of, of the city that is composed of many different neighborhoods. The Lower Nine is closer to the Mississippi, sort of right against, in a way, the canal, uh, and is one specific uh, neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So the East, I always think of as a much larger section of the, the city. And the book, The Yellow House, is very much a part of trying to own the city after the hurricane, and you feeling like, okay, it's my city too. Sure. And, and for me, this is a very old feeling, the feeling of what does it mean to belong to a place? What does it mean, for instance, to be a New Orleanian? And I was actually contending with this question long before Katrina. I was thinking about this the day after I left the Yellow House for college. I was thinking, what does it mean that I grew up in this house where the ground outside was always soft? So I was obsessing over that. And then I think what ended up happening was after Katrina came, and then in 2006, when the house was demolished, suddenly, as a writer, I was contending with loss. And, you know, I say in the work that I feel absence more strongly than presence. And I think the fact of that led me to try to interrogate what it meant what it all meant, right? And, and that was an enormous voyage that I couldn't have predicted. What did it mean for your family in 1961 for your mom to say, we're going to have a yellow house? Well, it was a big deal. You know, my mother bought the house at, when she was 19 years old, and it was her piece of land. It was her spot in the world. She made it incredibly beautiful. She sewed all the curtains for this house. You know, it was a place I think she instantly felt tethered to. And that part fascinates me, right? Because the house is the most perfect metaphor, I think, for who we all are in the world, for what it means to have a kind of interiority um, and to have a physical place that we're connected to. So, so for my mom, it meant all of those things. And in, then, of course, she raised her 12 children in that house. And so we were, in a way, you know, the little houses walking around when the house wasn't, wasn't there. And it was my mother who had the insight uh, about the ways in which people become houses and become places. And so you trace back 100 years, mm -hmm. I think, your family, to St. Rose, Louisiana, and then to the Yellow House mm -hmm. in New Orleans East. And it sort of culminates for you with this sense of place you get from the house. What was it like when all of a sudden the hurricane hits? So it's interesting because I had been having very conflicted feelings about the house in the years leading up to Katrina in 2005. And so I think the moment when the house was battered, which was really uh, what it was, was uh, shocking for me. That doesn't quite say it to call it shocking, but the moment I always think about was going there with my siblings. You know, we were there 
quite early back in New Orleans after the storm. My grandmother had, in fact, died uh, a month to the day of the storm. Uh, the day after her funeral, we drove to New Orleans East and went to see the house. Uh, my mother refused to get out of the car, uh, but all of us children sort of ran to it and noticed that, you know, by force of water, there was uh, another entrance made by nature, essentially, in the side of the house. And so we all stood, uh, you know, from the outside, peering in through this crack and seeing the detritus of lives lived, my brother's dry cleaning, and all the lampshades and the dressers from my childhood. Uh, and that moment, the feeling that something had been broken, that it would never be the same again, is something that haunts me still. Tell me about Carl. Tell me what happened to him in the hurricane and how he becomes a sentinel of this book. So Carl is one of my older brothers, and probably for me, just when I think of New Orleans, I think of Carl. He's that person for me. And so he stayed in New Orleans uh, during Katrina. In fact, he was acting like it was a really ordinary day. I think many people do, mm -hmm. uh, were, and still do to this day. Um, he drove home. He was aware that a storm was possibly coming. He fell asleep. He woke up, and there was water in the house. So the water kept rising and rising. And of course, this is after Katrina has already hit, right? What's happening now is that the levees have been breached and water is coming in. And Curl essentially escapes the house by cutting through the roof with an ax. Uh, he then stays on the roof for quite a long time and becomes a stranger in his own city. And then shortly after the house was damaged, he was going there and checking on it and seeing how the house was doing, as if the house was, you know, infirm, like as if it were a person, really. One of the things that's so painful in the book, and I feel so sorry about, too, is that the house then gets demolished mm -hmm. by the authorities because there's nobody there, it's off the foundations, mm -hmm. and you never get notified. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, tell me the pain of that. Well... That is a kind of existential feeling of loss for me. And what I mean by that is it's sort of, if something is there the day before and then suddenly not, the mind has a really hard time trying to process what happened. And so because my brother Carl, who is for me the kind of sentinel of the book, was showing up every day and sitting on this lot where, you know, where the house was, and then he actually fell ill and was in the hospital during the time when the notice was delivered and the house was ultimately demolished, he showed up one day after getting out of the hospital and it was simply gone. And then after the house was gone, he went there every single day after work and, and sat watch. And at some point he brought a very gorgeous, ornate wood table to the scene where our house used to be. And he set up chairs around it and all of his friends would come, and they'd hang out there. I would go there, and we'd hang out there. He made it a place. And in that way, Carl is my mother through and through, because that's the thing that she taught us. Whatever you have, you make it beautiful, you take care of it, you see to it. And Carl did that uh, all the way until, you know, the moment when the land was no longer ours. When the Hurricane Katrina hit, mm -hmm. You were actually, if I'm right, up here in New York City, right? You were a yes. very successful, well-known editor with, you know, Oprah's magazine, but also a journalist, a writer, had done many things. Uh, at first, you don't go home. I think you run into Samantha Power, the U.N. Mm -hmm. ambassador, mm -hmm. and you're bereft. Mm -hmm. And she gives you one word on a map that you may not have even known much about, right? Right. She says, go to Burundi. It was the strangest thing. I was sent in a kind of tailspin in the days after the storm, you know, where I just felt as if someone or something had died. And those of us who've ever known grief know the feeling and the experience of that. And I just remember being at a dinner with Samantha Power, who then was, you know, had just written a problem from hell and, and, and saying, I, you know, giving her some very complicated 
idea about how I wanted to go elsewhere and think about the global south and, you know, displacement. And she said, you should go to Burundi. And I said, where is Burundi? And that sort of set off this journey that, that I end up taking. You know, Samantha Power had said, you know, you don't need a railing, you know, meaning you just sort of show up. And I, I, I don't know why I thought to take her at her word, but I, I somehow did. But it was interesting to be in Burundi because I was completely stripped of any story I had of myself or any story I had been telling myself. Because in Burundi, no one knew any of these things I was talking about. You know, the people I, I was around barely knew where New Orleans was. None of this had any significance for them. It could not speak for me. I had to somehow be composed and be the person who I was without any of the narratives I had or the stories I was telling about myself. Um, and, and Burundi was great for that, for that reason. What did you learn about home and community and your own connection to home and community by being in Burundi? Well, you know, it was interesting because the, the thing I learned about myself is that I go around essentially trying to find siblings. And Burundi also reminded me that it was time to go back home, that these people were home, that Burundians had found their place and they were there wrestling with it and interrogating it and being in it. And it was time for me on some level to go back to the place I was essentially running from. And that's New Orleans, that's not New, New York. So you've <laughs> gone there New from Orleans. New York. But when you say home, you're referring to New Orleans. So after six months, you suddenly move back to New Orleans. Why? So after a year, actually, in Burundi, I, I decided to go back. I felt the gaps were becoming very apparent to me in terms of what I knew. You know, I, I didn't know anything about my siblings because it was really hard to talk to them, you know, uh, there was no WhatsApp at the time. Uh, my mother was writing these very sort of scarce letters that didn't have a lot of information. So I felt the distance. And I come from a family that is very close and, and very connected. Uh, so that, that felt uh, untenable for me. And then also, I got a random call from a woman working in City Hall. And working for Mayor Ray Nagin, who was then Nagin. Um, sort of embattled. Embattled at the time. And, and it came about that I was searching for a job. And, and a friend said, I have the perfect person. And then this woman calls me from City Hall and says, we've read some of your writing about New Orleans. We think you would be, you know, really good and perfect to sort of help us talk about the recovery. And so I talked to her on the phone, and it was a communications job. I decided it would be my way back uh, into New Orleans. One of the interesting things about the hurricane is that it brought people like yourself back mm -hmm. who had left New Orleans a long time ago, including me. Mm -hmm. I came back and moved mm -hmm. back to New Orleans. But on the flip side of that, we lost a mm -hmm. lot of people mm -hmm. that haven't come back mm -hmm. after the storm. How has that affected New Orleans and, to some extent, your sense of the place? Well, that's an important part of what happened. And for me and my own family, so many of my siblings have yet to return. You know, they found uh, better jobs elsewhere or they just financially haven't been able to come back. I think that has essentially changed, in a way, the nature of the city itself. And I remember right after, uh, you know, in 2008, when I came back to work for the mayor, living uh, on Cambrone Street in the Carrollton area, and realizing that the rent that I was paying was $800 higher than the rent, you know, before the storm. And it made me really think about how it was possible for people to return. Uh, and so I am hyper aware, I think, of, of how the fabric has changed. And I know that many New Orleanians have yet to return, even now. And have you moved back, do you think, for good? You know, I have a little yellow house. I never thought I wanted a yellow house. But uh, I fell in love with this yellow house in the Maroney neighborhood. 
And, you know, I'm there in New Orleans at least once a month to be with my mom and to be with my siblings. And so it's where I live part of the time. If I'm not in Harlem, I'm generally in my little house in the Marigny. It's nice to have a yellow house that's sort of in between the French Quarter that's and New true. Orleans East. Well, I hope you make it home. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.